Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dr. Munis Faruqi. I'm the director of the Institute of South Asia Studies. I also am a faculty person in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. Um, it gives me really uh, extraordinary pleasure to um, introduce Ambassador Sanjay Panda. Um, he has been um, the Council General of India in San Francisco since November of 2018, so he's relatively fresh to the Bay Area. But despite being relatively new, um, Ambassador Panda has already been making waves uh, across the Bay Area and California in terms of his attitude to um, being a Council General. What do I mean by that? Well, for starters, he has um, made it one of his priorities to try and streamline the Council of Bureaucracy to make the Council General's office more accessible to not just Indian Americans, but also citizens and others who are interested in visiting India, having anything to do with India. Um, I think his presence over here today is also testimony to the kind of openness that Ambassador Panda brings to institutions like Berkeley, but he's an extraordinarily busy man. We had originally scheduled a meeting with him on April the 6th, and then that got canceled because he was traveling. And uh, whenever we you know, try to invite him, he's always doing something <laughs> or the other. And on, on May the 1st. Don't, don't believe me. <laughs> well, on May the 1st, we have an event uh, focused on uh, journalists who have gone to India on a journalism trip. And I was you know, inviting uh, Ambassador Panda to join that. But of course, Ambassador Panda is meeting London Breed. So, you know, every now and then we get, we get to have you in, in our institute, but we are very grateful for um, your presence. Ambassador Panda, in, in addition to the work that he does through the, you know, to make the Council General's office, but also just the, you know, the, um, the Indian presence more visible, has been really at the forefront of a whole set of conversations over the past many months, reaching out to business communities and other kinds of thought leaders across the Bay Area and trying to um, basically present a image of India as a country that um, you know, Indian Americans obviously, but also others want to visit, invest in, and a country that they want to take very seriously, which they should. These are skills that Ambassador Panda has honed over many decades. He's been in the Foreign Service since 1991, and uh, prior to his appointment over here, he was Joint Secretary for the Indian Ocean Region, the Ministry of External Affairs in Delhi. But prior to that, um, he had appointments in as diverse countries as Belgium, uh, France, Japan, Jordan, Malaysia, and uh, the Seychelles. And I did not read that in order of importance. It was done alphabetically, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Um, of course, such service to India complements other kinds of commitments, personal commitments to India and India's well-being. And perhaps something that struck me um, when I was you know, doing some research for this introduction was the fact that his family is deeply involved in various kinds of humanitarian activities in his hometown in Odisha, which is where he's from. And um, they have done a lot of philanthropic work, including setting up a hospital, schools, and really being at the forefront of various kinds of activities around sanitation and other kinds of well-being for the local community. So there's both a kind of public persona that one appreciates generally in individuals like him, but also a real commitment to service to India on a personal um, level that I certainly find very interesting and enriching. So we are very thrilled to have Ambassador Panda over here, but I would also just like to say that his presence marks a really old line uh, of ambassadors to the Bay Area who have managed to cultivate really good relations with the Institute. And we've had some extraordinary partnerships over the past 20, 30 years. And I, look out into the crowd and I see Tom Metcalf here, I see Robert Goldman over there, um, both past directors who were at the forefront of efforts to actually create various kinds of partnerships and associations with the Council General's office. And I just, just for your information, I mean, we have an association that goes back to the 80s, but it really kind of came to fruit in the early 1990s when the then Honorable Ambassador Sipinder Lamba helped set up an Indo-American community chair, which is something that now is um, in the hands of Professor Pradeep Chipper, who's a very well-known political scientist. But we also have a distinguished um, community lecture series that was set up around the same time, again in association 
with ambassadors at Dindar Lamba, and I believe Bob, you were at the forefront of some of that activities, some of those activities. But you know, these lectureships, I mean, just to give you a sense of their value to you know, us at Berkeley as an institution, the institute, I mean, just take the um, Indo-American community lectureship. Um, I mean, we've had people, we've got uh, Tanika Sarkar, the historian coming in this coming week, but over the past many years, Nanda Sundar, Pratap Banu Mehta, Nivita Menon, Bramla Thapar, Anita Bhaskar, Ashish Nandi, Upendra Bakshi, and the list goes on. Um, none of this would be possible without the partnerships that get created um, between us, and these are old friendships, old partnerships. Other kinds of activities that have been sponsored over the years, Hindi language celebration days. Um, <coughs> right now, my colleague Solomon Darwin is running a, a large smart villages project um, in Arunachal Pradesh. He's had it in um, Andhra Pradesh as well. Uh, one of the individuals who's been really helpful in getting this project off the ground was your predecessor, uh, Ambassador Ashok Venkatesan, who just recently retired. And then finally, you know, when one thinks about the future and one thinks about the kinds of relationships that we have with the Council General's office over here, I mean, we obviously, you know, look to them for help when it comes to council uh, activities, visas, you know, other kinds of advice about how to negotiate the Indian <coughs> bureaucracy, especially getting our students and sometimes faculty over there. But it's also things like the fact that Mahatma Gandhi's um, 150th anniversary is coming up uh, pretty soon. And we have been in conversation with the ambassador's office about you know, trying to celebrate it in an appropriate fashion this coming fall. So these are old friendships. Uh, they're ones that are constantly <coughs> managed by people like Ambassador Panda. And so on that note, I welcome him to the podium. He's going to say a few words to you. And then we're just going to open it up to conversation. Um, and I will be the moderator of that conversation. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Panda. <laughs> Thank you, Manis, uh, for this uh, kind uh, introduction. And uh, just uh, that uh, it's not that I'm uh, not available. It's just that uh, <laughs> I have this sneaking feeling uh, that uh, Dr. Munis Faruqi and his team first checks my schedule. Then <laughs> so that, uh, okay. Uh, well, I'm uh, good afternoon. I'm really honored and privileged uh, that uh, you have thought of me and uh, you have thought of uh, welcoming me. Uh, well, uh, four months here. I, I cannot tell you that uh, how delighted I am to be uh, to have decided to uh, take up this assignment. Uh, in fact, uh, I call it a refreshing change for me. My entire career in the Foreign Service uh, has been in dealing with bilateral issues, dealing with strategic matters, and uh, if I tell you all that uh, I have done in Delhi, uh, I uh, during the three separate stints which I had uh, apart from my assignments abroad, where uh, uh, handling uh, Nepal policy, which is critically important for India, very important neighbor, and. Uh, uh, the second time around, I was looking after China. I was uh, director of China, so uh, although that is something which is kind of uh, kept for, we call it in our uh, foreign office, the Chinese mafia. I was one of the outsiders. I'm a, I'm a French speaker, so I was kind of brought in, and uh, the then foreign secretary said, "Look, I want somebody who." doesn't have this tunnel vision, but can bring about a fresh perspective. So I remember quipping then that, uh, okay, so you wanted to get somebody who had no vision. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, that was a uh, very interesting uh, two years, uh, handling China, Japan, Korea, and uh, Dalai Lama, uh, His Holiness, in India. And then uh, I uh, went on my posting as deputy ambassador to Japan, and from there I was ambassador in a tiny island called the Seychelles. And then before coming and uh, looking after the Indian Ocean region uh, with uh, maritime security as my primary responsibility, and uh, that is when this new concept of Indo-Pacific uh, uh, evolved. In fact, I was uh, associated with the uh, group that uh, formulated this policy, which was articulated by Prime Minister Modi during the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. 
So, so to tell you that I've been mostly dealing with uh, bilateral uh, political strategic matters, and this is right at the fag end of my career. I thought of uh, you know the Californian sunshine. <laughs> I, knew the, I knew about uh, the wonderful golf courses. I knew about the warm people. And I thought I could move around in my jeans and t-shirts. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I uh, we're very excited. And then uh, technology innovation, uh, something which uh, always uh, excited me. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the hub of uh, education, like uh, institutions like where I'm standing today, Berkeley, Stanford, and uh, quite a lot here. So, so there was a lot of excitement uh, when I came, but only thing I can tell you that I haven't had a single round of golf since coming. <laughs> uh, all the community ensures uh, that uh, all my weekends are taken care of. And uh, uh, I must tell you that uh, not many people realize actually San Francisco is the world's largest, uh, is actually India's largest consulate in the world. I mean, it covers uh, both in terms of geographic uh, area. I mean, it is uh, 11 states, uh, including Alaska and uh, Hawaii. And apart from that, the federal territory of Guam, which was actually closer to Japan than from here. Anyway, so th that's a huge uh, geographic area. And on top of it, there's a uh, 1.45 million Indian diaspora. So, and I'm not counting the non-Indian diaspora friends of India. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's, a, it's a very heavy charge, but uh, I can tell you the last four, five months, I have really uh, enjoyed what I was doing. And I feel really sorry that uh, uh, you know, the consulate uh, cannot really meet the expectation of the uh, large uh, Indian diaspora in terms of uh, you know, the consulate services. Uh, uh, extending them the consular services which they really uh, deserve. That is because when this consulate was uh, originally, uh, when it came about, uh, the, it was uh, really uh, handling a uh, diaspora which was about 40,000 to 50,000. And uh, we never expected uh, that uh, uh, there was no Silicon Valley then. And uh, uh, suddenly, you know, the change came about in the 80s, 90s, and <coughs> the pace at which it moved, and the pace at which India as a country moved. Unfortunately, the diplomatic and the consular setup here has not kept pace with that in terms of, I mean, we have space constraint, we have uh, constraints of human resources. In fact, to be very honest, every day I reach office, I get depressed when I look at the building. I said, this doesn't uh, reflect India. Uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's quite a struggle to change things also in the city of San Francisco because the building norms, you know, if I talk about, uh, okay, breaking it and building something new. So, so anyway, that's uh, something I'm uh, digressing slightly. But uh, there are a lot of things uh, uh, which uh, I want to do, but uh, if wishes were uh, horses, then probably <laughs> I could have moved uh, a little faster. Anyway. I wanted to tell uh, Dr. Faruqi and all of you here that uh, uh, one of my major agenda is to engage with the universities, education uh, institutions, especially UC Berkeley during my tenure here. In fact, this is an institution, this university has had a very strong India Connect, a very strong India Connect. And in fact, uh, my predecessor, uh, when uh, he retired, he left me a handing over note. And I was wondering why 50% of that handing over note was about UC Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it could have been. Uh, <laughs> so so that, is, uh, that means he felt very strongly that uh, the kind of engagement uh, which we have with UC Berkeley is only the tip of the iceberg. And in fact, uh, one of the, the you mentioned about uh, Professor Solomon uh, and Darwin, in fact, uh, I've had uh, a few rounds of conversation with him, the kind of work uh, which uh, he's doing. Uh, 
uh, you know the smart village project smart village project uh, the way it has been conceived and this is uh, it has actually come from here and uh, the pilot project was such a success that now arunachal pradesh is implementing it and then it is actually providing uh, digitally empowering the villages so that you avoid middleman and you go directly so basically empowering the villages through uh, 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 <coughs> in this digi uh, uh, using the digital technology many silicon valley uh, companies are partnering with them and the way it's moving i won't be surprised if this actually in the next 10 to 20 years encompasses the entire country and because the states now the states in india are assuming importance and they are uh, now uh, picking up uh, these ideas and implementing without really looking at the center to steer the process which is a very positive development if you ask me where i come from the state of orissa and i uh, visited only about a week ago i was there for 4 5 days and i cannot tell you the change that i saw in the place in the capital city of bhubneswar was absolutely amazing i mean i uh, uh, you know uh, it's uh, you're talking about uh, bureaucracy and uh, the how difficult the bureaucrats uh, can get that's one place where the chief minister has actually passed on empowered the bureaucracy and passed it on to them that you drive the process this is what i want to see and only uh, well, you know uh, reading out the riot act the zero tolerance for corruption so now what i saw was absolutely unbelievable i uh, saw a city in india which uh, absolutely spick and span there were cycling lanes there were walking green tracks uh, along every road where you could walk you don't have any plastic or paper lying on the streets in fact when i was saying somebody smoked a cigarette and stopped it on the road there was an elderly gentleman who was taking a walk he picked it up and went and threw it in the bin i was so impressed uh, by what i saw and they have cycles now put in there it's it's something so this kind of change which happened to this city the capital city of bhubneswar uh, is uh, probably something uh, which uh, people couldn't uh, envisage could happen in india i mean there are slums slums have been very nicely done up without demolishing it you know the walls have been it's cleaned up a nice look and uh, you know everything it gives a very you have this uh, uh, sense uh, that everybody is happy here so when i talk about uh, you know this is about uh, smart cities but then 70% of india <laughs> is in villages so in fact uh, when you mentioned about my uh, this is an idea which i got uh, from my sister who has a foundation and she does uh, quite a lot of uh, this philanthropic activities she actually adopted uh, our ancestral village which we had uh, we hardly seen also i mean i don't remember seeing it ever and she might have visited there once nobody is there that village was adopted and then i suddenly realized that it doesn't cost the earth to actually adopt a village and do it so after I've come here the many affluent indian diaspora members have been work here there's a question they ask that how is it i can contribute something to my country of origin my country of ancestors without really having to fight for it go through red tapism and bureaucracy how is it uh, that i can really do something and feel happy about it and then the answer which i am now uh, telling people is that just don't even talk to the bureaucracy don't even talk to the government go and adopt and uh, adopt a village all that you have to do is go to the district administration tell him brother i am going to take this village i am going to do it up and obviously the, uh, they won't have any difficulty you are doing their job is they can't do because of many constraints so now this i very strongly feel with the smart village project which uh, berkeley is doing which is basically empowering them digitally now if infrastructure and other things can be done by adapting a village that 
would make a major, major difference. Anyway, that's, uh, I'm actually, there are so many thoughts on digressing, so uh, what I'll do is uh, probably uh, when I sit down and, uh, uh, you know, we talk, probably I could uh, answer some of your questions, we could make it more interactive, but uh, uh, there are so many, so many things uh, that uh, I see that uh, uh, we could do together. We could do together is something uh, which uh, I feel that uh, well, uh, the time is moving very fast, so I have to move very fast, and I need uh, you with me to work together in uh, uh, you know uh, reaching there. Uh, in fact, uh, I must uh, tell you that uh, there are uh, certain projects which we are doing with Berkeley. You know, that's uh, there's so much of. Uh, stuff which you have in your archives, especially one of the important parts of uh, the, uh, our freedom struggle was well, actually uh, the spark did come from here. The revolutionaries, you know, were inspired by the Gadaris, the Gadar movement, and so much of Gadar literature is actually available with you. And we are uh, working. In fact, I was uh, discussing uh, about the. Uh, you know, the project to uh, help uh, digitize the entire uh, uh, government documents and the collection which you have here. In fact, uh, there are so many projects I mean, we could do together. And in fact, uh, why I'm particularly excited in uh, coming to, uh, uh, to UC Berkeley and uh, the other day I was in Stanford uh, addressing the graduate students is because uh, had I not joined the Foreign Service, I could have been probably been part of the you know, teaching profession and uh, joined I mean, I was, <laughs> It's just that I was doing my MPhil in uh, international relations. That was the time when the European integration had not happened, and that was the project which I was doing. Uh, then you get into service and you don't even complete it, and you go on a different tangent. I thought I'll do it later, but I never completed it. But then things have moved so much that uh, there was no use of my uh, saying that, look, there were certain things which I had predicted, but I never published my paper, which did happen. So, <laughs> Euro and other things. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for receiving me uh, again, and uh, I think uh, we could uh, make it a little interactive and uh, you Please go ahead and ask the ambassador any questions you have. Uh, yeah, please, please do introduce yourself. So that oh, hi, my name is Shubham. Um, I'm a freshman at Berkeley and I'm from Mumbai, India. Uh, ambassador, you spoke about uh, affluent Indians approaching you uh, to make an impact in India. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one aspect of it. Um, I know there's an organization which works in Japan called Jetro, which works with Indian businessmen for investment in India. Um, Japan investors. Is there any organization or any help uh, the Consul General in uh, America provides to people looking for investments in India uh, from the Indian community? Uh, see, uh, there's no organization in San Francisco, right. but uh, we do have a full fledged setup in DC. Okay. Um, but uh, what I notice that DC doesn't uh, really, I mean, it's very difficult to. Uh, uh, get access to uh, all parts of the U.S. In fact, I uh, pitched in for having an exclusive trade office. But the focus is, uh, you see, my deputy, deputy council general, his primary mandate is actually to focus on trade, uh, investment, technology, innovation. You see, India has an insatiable appetite for uh, innovation, I mean, uh, and technology. Uh, it's just that, you know, when people uh, are very excited, they're talking about, uh, uh, you know, 5G, as the 5G rollout is happening, they say India is a major market. But what people don't realize, that does India have the infrastructure to absorb this technology? Actually, no, India doesn't have the infrastructure. And so when I talk to the Silicon Valley here, I tell them that your primary focus should be to build that infrastructure in India so that your 5G rollout uh, becomes a success. And don't look at it as charity. It will be a win-win situation. You just look at it commercially. That infrastructure which you create is in the long run going to help you. So these kind of uh, uh, you know, 
uh, approach. Uh, unfortunately, although we had these ideas, given a choice, uh, I'd let my deputy go and uh, uh, do it. That's his primary mandate. But his primary focus is to, uh, and now in reality, his primary focus is to get the consular services in order and uh, do the firefighting everyday basis. But that is, uh, having said that, uh, we have uh, something called Invest India, which is doing very well. We are really uh, reaching out and uh, so we are, uh, what we are doing, is your option, is immediately putting them in touch uh, with Invest India, which is now, uh, you know, responding on real time basis. So, not perfect, but you can say it's a uh, work in progress. Um, hi, I'm, hi. Anna. I'm an undergraduate here. Yes. Um, I was born in the U.S. My parents are here. Um, I wanted to ask about one of your experiences um, while you were serving abroad. Is that okay? Yeah. So I know you were in Malaysia after Mahathir stepped down, and mm -hmm. there was a lot of um, protests within the Tamil community about you know getting more representation. Can you talk a little bit about how that experience was for you representing India there and seeing you know ethnic Indians? See, uh, there's a very, uh, there's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, I wish uh, the Chatham House rules applied here so that I could have been uh, a little more candid. Uh, but uh, <laughs> when I know that uh, there's something watching me and uh, <laughs> put in there, so uh, okay. Uh, after this, I can yeah. tell you a little more. But, uh, <laughs> but, what I, but what I wanted to tell you that uh, in Malaysia, there's a very clear cut uh, division I mean, Malay, Chinese, Indian. Mm -hmm. And who are the Indians? Indians came as plantation workers there. Then they kind of excelled and uh, there were, uh, you know, the teaching profession, the lawyers, they, you know, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge community. It's a huge community. So, uh, the, uh, when uh, uh, Mahathir uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, during that period, and then uh, the Indian community there, they felt uh, that uh, they are being marginalized uh, because uh, there is a, you know, there was some efforts to. Uh, okay, easy. Uh, there was some effort. Uh, there was okay. There were dynamics at work. <laughs> Let me put it at this way. And that was the time when the community actually reached out to the Indian diplomatic mission, trying to pitch in and take up their cause. You know, then this, that is, to a certain extent, you can go and uh, talk because, uh, you know, after all, uh, there's the Indian diaspora. But if you get into the policy issues of a country, then that amounts to interference in the internal affairs. So a line had to be drawn, and without that line, the uh, uh, you know whatever diplomatically could be conveyed. And uh, uh, but then, if you notice, the period after uh, Mahathir when Badawi came, and uh, are, are you aware of the yeah. Malaysian? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, and then uh, you know Badawi's uh, uh, successors. Uh, Razak, right? Huh? Razak, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Razak. Uh, he had a uh, uh, you know very uh, close uh, fascination towards India, and his uh, wife could do anything for Indian movies for Bollywood, and uh, mm -hmm. so you know that was the time there was a film called Dawn, which was uh, sh shot uh, in. Uh, India, in uh, uh, Malaysia, because uh, great fans of Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's besides the point. But then the, uh, there was a gentleman who was uh, like uh, the leader of the Indian community called Sami Velu, mm -hmm. Dato Sami Velu. And uh, he uh, was trying to take up this cause, but at the same time he was then offered a ministerial birth, so the voice uh, you know, comes down a little bit. But eventually, the younger generation among the Indian community, they, uh, you know, came up in the ranks in the Malaysian Indian Congress. So, uh, they, the Indian community, has actually kept its separate identity, 
but this is what i could not fathom in a country which clearly says that we have three distinct communities malay chinese india then it becomes a little difficult in uh, identifying yourself as one nation so uh, but uh, i'm sure uh, <laughs> every country moves in a particular way and uh, but we have having said that we have excellent relations with so malaysia go ahead i'm david zanton i was the director of international and area studies here at berkeley for a number of years and i wanted to underscore two things that you said in your presentation uh, one is that it is not very expensive to do something very creative and productive in india from the part of people here i've been involved with the middle of the painters the madhubani painters in ah, bihar wonderful uh, since actually at a distance since uh, uh, 1977 and very close on an annual basis since 2002 and when in 2002 it appeared that the painting tradition was going to die because young women were no longer interested to learn how to paint from their mothers we proposed to the artists the senior artists that a would we ask if an art school would encourage the the a new generation of painters we've run that school now for 16 years graduated something over 500 young artists of 99% young women empowered earning money from their paintings and having a sense of you know, their own competence and it's cost $10,000 a year to 25 students 25 students a year cost $10,000 a year for everything for rent electricity paper materials uh, car fare for them to travel money for them to go back and forth from the villages to the school which is in the central town of Madhubani and it's had just an enormous effect in a reflowering of, of the middle of painting tradition such that now um, there's there are efforts to make Madhubani the Florence of Italy of India mm -hmm. uh, and a very small amount of money can do an enormous amount of good and, uh, and this is done this is oh. something that, that we've been doing the other thing that I wanted to underscore was the depth of of Berkeley's uh connection with with India in 1997 Berkeley uh had an exhibition of middle of paintings 97 97 okay uh to honor the 50th anniversary of Indian independence it turns out that that was the only thing that the University of California did to honor that the 50th anniversary of independence but it was an exhibition here with the director uh, of the of the museum uh, here at the the old museum before it got transferred to the new site but we were very pleased to be able to do something to, to honor that tradition and India at that particular point in time and that's probably not in the list of materials that, that your predecessor left for you it's a, but it is another another uh, way in which this institution really does relate to India and care about India uh, and a few others do so i must uh, uh, salute you for uh, uh, what you just uh, uh, said and uh, this is uh, something uh, which uh, i feel uh, very strongly and uh, i'm really very happy that uh, you have had this uh, ideas uh, long before anybody thought about it and uh, there is so much of artistic tradition which is there in india which is now dying and uh, come to think of it uh, uh, we are not able to preserve it this is really really sad and uh, uh, madhubani i mean this is uh, something i mean i now i know how the madhubani resurrection has happened i didn't know this part mm -hmm. i just knew that uh, you know suddenly i find a madhubani resurrection actually my wife is an artist so mm -hmm. i get a little i mean of course she does uh, oil on canvas so she uh, i mean i hear a little bit about uh, uh, this you know there's a there's something called worldly art mm -hmm. uh, which is a little uh, akin to the I mean 
a little different, yeah. uh, a distinct, but uh, uh, you know the art mm -hmm. style uh, actually follows the Madhubani, uh, and so of course it's a tribal art. So in fact, in that context, actually she was telling me, but uh, uh, in fact, I was always wondering that how uh, this resurrection came about. And 97, I'm, I'm going to find out more about it. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I that. think I can send you a copy. Yeah, please, of the I mean, I'd, I'd really be, I'd really be delighted because I'm actually trying to document uh, certain things for posterity which are not there <laughs> in all <the> books. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I mean, you moved from um, I mean, we're living in India, from one of the most polluted places in the world to the Bay Area, which is one of the cleaner places in the world. Good mm -hmm. for your lungs, of course. But I wanted to, you know, let you know that we're just creating uh, next month a um, policy, a joint policy center between Berkeley and IIT, is located at the Habitat Center in Delhi, mm -hmm. and it works on, you know, bringing science into policy for the country and it will engage both um, Indian and uh, Berkeley students over time it's, um, and we have the money and we have the space and we're just starting up so it's uh, something I hope to hear a lot more about because the problem I'm a professor of global environmental health here mm -hmm. on campus and you know India has the most severe air pollution problem in the world in terms of health impacts mm -hmm. and it consists of both the traditional form, you know, the use of chulas and households, but also the modern forms that we're all familiar with. And, you know, it, it's not sustainable in the country. And, but there are some things that can be done that we believe based on the science that can actually bring bring some, bring India down to levels that are helpful for its population. No, absolutely. We actually uh, uh, look forward to that. I mean, it's uh, just a question of uh, you know, having stayed in Delhi my last two years before coming here. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, the day I was traveling to San Francisco. Uh, uh, you know, there was a joke uh, among our fraternity and other service colleagues, uh, some sitting here as well now. Uh, okay, uh, from other services. Yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, they always say that the Foreign service officers, the diplomats have a very delicate composition because they get exposed to uh, better uh, living standards <laughs> and then they come back to India. You know, we have a classification of uh, stations as A, A asterisk, A, B, C, C asterisk. Mm -hmm. If A asterisk is, uh, okay, United States, I mean, San Francisco is A asterisk. If I'm in Kabul, which is a non-family station or Baghdad, it's C asterisk, where you just spent 18 months, uh, so it's a C asterisk. And Delhi, we call it D. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a, that's a joke, but, uh, but it's a fact that uh, uh, the air quality, but uh, how many of us know that, uh, of course, Delhi doesn't have anything of its own. If there's a sandstorm in Rajasthan, the dust comes. If uh, uh, it snows in uh, the Himalayas, suddenly Delhi shivers. So uh, it doesn't have anything of its own. And uh, But what could have been avoided is when people burn the crop in Punjab, the pollution uh, comes to Delhi. I mean, Delhi, where the entire northern bit, I mean, Delhi is more noticed. So anyway, that is something uh, also then uh, it uh, comes into, you know, the role of uh, politicians in stopping there's a major constituency, uh, you know, there's, uh, and there's an easier way of uh, disposing of your, uh, your, you know, remnants of after the harv after harvesting. But there are, okay, there are ways uh, and there are some ideas I'm sure uh, you'd come other, up with other how countries it could be. these problems too. So many of them learn, you know, it's got its own special problems. But yes. Problems that have come about here in China and in Europe yeah. Yeah. that you can draw expertise from other places and lots yeah, sure. of people willing to help. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, no, e eventually I'm sure uh, it's uh, going to happen. But I must tell you, as an anecdote, I must tell you that the day I was coming to San Francisco, uh, 14th of November, it was a very bad day in Delhi, so we had uh, our masks on. I actually
actually uh, my son was in the US, he had sent some very special $30 mask which uh, was available for 300 rupees in Delhi, but uh, anyway, <laughs> so he sent it, uh, so I used the same masks, okay. So uh, then uh, at the airport, finally, we moved it, my wife and I, we put it uh, in the garbage, I said we're going to San Francisco. And 14th of November, reached San Francisco, got out, the air quality was worse than Delhi. You can't imagine I felt so much at home. <laughs> I felt at home. I was, it was as if San Francisco was waiting to receive me. And but within, uh, within five years, uh, five, within a week, uh, that uh, changed. But, uh, but that helped me in the acclimatization and that helped me in understanding the issues and uh, I'm sure, sir, I don't know, we could do with your expertise and I uh, really, this is an area which uh, I would uh, really appreciate uh, UC Berkeley mm -hmm. and your efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, may I? Yeah, please. Uh, sir, uh, the, as you know, we are here for just one semester fellow. One thing we have realized, the Berkeley is a huge community, more than 41,000 of students. And a lot of Indian community students are coming in different form, different manners, some government of India, some, some university assisted. So whether uh, a CG office can develop a mechanism to more streamline the process by which uh, from the talented students from the not so developed part of the India and as well from the better uh, universities like IITs and IIM can have more educational collaboration but by between the Indian uh, academic institutions and the UC Berkeley. It's happening, sir, but it's happening at your own ways. Uh, UC Berkeley has relations with some university in India, then government of India has something. So, uh, can you, can it? So, what you are saying is that uh, uh, it's more uh, ad hoc uh, what you have now, yeah. and it should be institutionalized. I couldn't agree with you more, but uh, then I uh, actually these ideas. Uh, are uh, always there. It's just that there are certain constraints uh, which we have in terms of uh, human resources, which uh, uh, is actually preventing uh, us from implementing or even flagging or initiating many ideas which we have. So, uh, but uh, this uh, is very well taken. This is very well taken. And uh, you know, you coming here for one semester and going back. Remember, you go back, but then you are the permanent uh, ambassador of Berkeley in India. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I, I would, uh, I would uh, throw it on you. Sure. Most welcome. Yeah. Just one point, since uh, Ambassador since you mentioned tribal art, I wanted to make an announcement to you and to the others here that we're going to be having a distinguished visitor from the uh, Indira Gandhi uh, National Center for the Arts on the last two days of this month. Professor Mali Kosho will be talking uh, on a Gandhi art of the Ramayana. Uh -huh. She has a film she's made at, on an intercommunal Ramlila in Keria village in uh, Uttar Pradesh. So uh, I hope you'll be able to join us for uh, those events if possible. So And all of you, please, uh, as we help at our department. Professor Baruki will tell me that. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Is it only on 29th and 30th? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Two separate talks. <laughs> we'll send them. I'm, we'll send them. Out. I'm in LA coming back on the 30th. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the video. <laughs> no, no, do send me an invite because I'm coming back uh, on the 30th. Uh, uh, I don't exactly remember, but I'm, uh, I'll be here on midday if there's anything. On the 30th the afternoon, probably. Uh, Three to five. Three to five. Maybe another couple of questions and then Yes. Uh, so, so I just wanted to know the ground any countries uh, where there is a condition that they have to mediately spend two years back in their country after they have acquired the qualification here. No, uh, can, can you repeat your question? Yeah. I didn't understand. So there are many countries, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, those who have put in a special condition that once you have acquired the qualification here, mm -hmm. you have to go back to your parent country. Uh, disseminate this information and then only you can come back. Is that so? Yes, sir. Or but yeah, in India we have not had this kind of a condition. Don't you feel that if we put in those conditions, it will oh, be that, that change our information back home? No, or is I, it, uh, I, 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 I don't. Uh, I've, uh, 
I don't think that should be any condition. And uh, you see, any qualification, any expertise which is there, uh, I mean, it should go global. I mean, people should have uh, absolutely free to, uh, you know, spread it anywhere. Uh, you see, if uh, India starts uh, putting this condition that, okay, you're going out and you have to come back uh, before you go out and two years you spend, then, uh, you know, then it becomes a benevolent dictatorship. Like Singapore tried it very successfully, but Singapore model cannot be replicated in India. India is too large. So uh, uh, this I don't uh, uh, agree. In fact, uh, you know, very interesting conversation. There was a fireside chat uh, which I was having with Silicon Valley, and there was this idea. Somebody after that, when we opened for interaction with the, it was a very interesting point. They said, uh, "Look, uh, your make in India is not uh, gone up anywhere. So why don't you uh, add something like?" Uh, uh, you know, there are people who are looking at the Indian market. Then they say that make in India, sell in India. I mean, that means you're basically, oh, what you are saying, already uh, uh, United States has reacted uh, and uh, GSP is, uh, and now you're saying that tighten it further. Uh, if you want to sell in India, then make in India. Uh, I, I somehow don't subscribe to this philosophy at all. I mean, at a personal level and uh, I don't know, I don't think even the government thinking is done on these lines. And, and if these are, then, uh, I, would, uh, I would take it with a pinch of salt. I, I mean, you see, we are more and more getting global now. I mean, this uh, artificial barriers which you have, I mean, these are all man-made barriers. So, uh, I mean, of course, historically, there's always been there. But if you see the barriers are the main reason for conflict. I mean, uh, uh, anyway, I shouldn't be talking about it. There's also then I could digress into uh, you were there, ma'am. I mean, uh, uh, you talk about re uh, religion. I mean, if Karl Marx once said religion is the opium of the masses, I mean that's uh, okay. Karl Marx philosophy at that point, I mean, it uh, excited many uh, intellectuals. But uh, then, if you look at it, I mean, it's actually if you see any major conflict situations anywhere in the world. Uh, there's a religious angle to it. I mean, this. Uh, I mean, this. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, religion per se is bad. I mean, you keep it something. I mean, uh, if somebody asks me, "Are you religious?" I, uh, uh, you see, we believe in one God. So, uh, and God is very busy. One God and seven billion people. If everybody starts uh, telling him, "Help me out." then uh, the poor chap can't uh, deliver to everybody. <laughs> so whenever, I mean, as a kid, even if my exam results were to be out, then only I used to just <laughs> give him a lunch. So, uh, I mean, you can't. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, such a restrictive regime, I don't think I could uh, <laughs> subscribe to.